Hello, everyone, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 11. Uh, this lecture is going to be in only one part, um, which is exciting. Um, and it's just a chapter for you if you are looking to bring balance to your life, or like Darth Vader, um, if you're trying to bring balance to the Force. Uh, what's also important in the case of equilibrium is bringing balance to the torque as well as balance to the force. And I'm kind of surprised uh, that neither Obi-Wan nor Qui-Gon Jinn nor the Jedi Council talked about the importance of bringing balance to the torque um, as well as balance to the force. And perhaps that's why the Star Wars prequels turned out as badly as they did, um, both in terms of the prequels quality um, and what the story was for our protagonists. Ouch. Um, anyway, let's continue on with uh, Chapter 11, Equilibrium. So for an extended body to be in static equilibrium, two conditions must be satisfied, and you have to satisfy both conditions. The first condition is that the vector sum of all external forces acting on the body must be zero. And it's a little bit easier to think about this in component form. So uh, the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to zero, the sum of forces in the y direction is equal to zero, and the sum of forces in the z direction um, is also equal to zero. So there's not going to be any net linear acceleration um, because there is no net force. And the second condition is that the sum of external torques must be equal uh, to zero about any point. So the sum of the torques uh, is equal to zero, um, and that is for any point um, along that rotating body, um, or along that body which may potentially rotate. Um, <clears throat> all right, so not only are you having no uh, linear acceleration, you are also not going to have any angular acceleration if you're dealing with an equilibrium. So we're going to be dealing um, with circumstances in this chapter where the body is at rest. Um, you could have an equilibrium situation where the body is moving, it's tumbling through space, um, and it's translating, as long as there is no acceleration, um, either in the linear or angular direction. However, we're not going to deal with that in this chapter, um, so we're going to be dealing with something called a static equilibrium, um, which is, as you might imagine, an equilibrium which which is static, uh, meaning that things are not moving. <clears throat> All right. So uh, let's just kind of take a quick sort of brain teaser here. Um, in which case are we dealing with equilibrium conditions? Um, so um, when we're dealing with A here, we're looking at this wheel, and we've got two forces, one of them pointing up this way, one of them pointing up this way, and they're op on opposite ends of a circle. And <laughs> you have a force which is acting through the axis of rotation um, and it's acting straight down. Um, or, sorry, actually, I read this diagram incorrectly. Um, the axis of rotation uh, is perpendicular to the figure, um, so it's staring you right in the face. And this force here um, is acting in the negative y direction, so it's acting straight down. So uh, to recap and to recap this correctly, um, we have a force pointing up, we have a force pointing up, we have a force of 2F pointing down, um, and the rotation is going to be taking place in this plane, um, in this XY plane, all right? So we say, uh, are, are the equilibrium conditions satisfied? First, let's take a look at what's going on with the forces. So you've got a force up, you've got a force up, so F plus F minus 2F, and again, if we define our axes is being like this, you know, we've got plus y over here and plus x over here, um, then we can see that it's two forces going up, two forces going down, therefore the forces are equal to zero. Okay, um, how about the torques? Well, we have one torque, uh, which is going in a counterclockwise direction, um, which is going to be the positive direction in this case, and we have one torque that's tending to rotate this in the opposite direction, um, which is going to be the negative direction. So we have F times L um, uh, times sine of 90 degrees, so times one, um, minus, F minus F times L sine of 90 degrees, also one. So FL minus FL um, is going to be, you know, one going this way, one going this way plus 2F times zero. And that's because um, this force is acting directly through the center of mass, um, and it's acting parallel to the radius. Um, so it's 2F 
sine of zero degrees, which is zero, um, and that's going to entirely equal zero because again, the force is parallel to the radius. Um, that means that it is not exerting a torque. Um, so FL minus FL plus zero is zero. So this is an example of a static equilibrium. How about this second example down here? Let's first take a look at the forces. Well, you got one force that's pointing up and one force that's pointing down. And however you want to define your axes, uh, one of these forces is going to be positive, one of these forces is going to be negative, so the force is zero. But what about the torques? Well, this force is rotating the wheel in this direction. This force is rotating the wheel in this direction. Huh, that's the same direction. These forces are going to be additive. Um, and because both rotations are happening in the clockwise direction, I'm going to refer to them as a negative torque. So negative FL minus FL um, is, go is not going to equal zero. Um, again, assuming that this force does not equal zero. Um, so the torques uh, do not equal zero, and therefore this is not in equilibrium. Right? How about a third example? Uh, where we have uh, a force of F and a force of 2F, uh, but they're acting at different distances from the center um, or from the uh, axis about which this thing rotates. So if we take a look at the torques, we have F times L going in this direction and 2F times 1 half L going in that direction. So the torques actually balance. You end up with a sum of zero torque. Uh, however, the forces uh, definitely do not. You've got a force going in this direction. You've got a force going in this direction. Um, so it's F plus two F, uh, and that does not equal zero, assuming that you have a non-zero force. So what exactly is gonna be happening here? Um, it's gonna travel like a hockey puck. Um, it's going to slide. Um, but it's not actually going to spin, and the acceleration is going to be in the linear direction um, as opposed to um, any sort of spinning. Um, and just to kind of, you know, um, work that analogy a little bit um, or to say, okay, what, uh, what's going on? Here, what we have is the wheel will begin spinning, um, but it will not be translating. Um, whereas in this first, in the actual equilibrium condition, you will neither spin nor rotate, you will neither spin nor translate uh, this wheel. Okay? So we've seen what an equilibrium is, and we've seen what an equilibrium isn't. Um, how do we use that to actually solve some problems? So uh, think about the setup and execution of these sorts of problems, and we're going to do three examples um, to show you what this looks like in action. First is to sketch the physical situation and identify what body in equilibrium is the thing that we actually want to analyze. Then you should draw a free body diagram um, and a rigid body diagram showing all forces acting on the body. What do I mean by a rigid body diagram? Well, we're going to see um, things like rods, um, you know, and you're having a force on one end of the rod and you're having a force on the other end of the rod, and these forces might tend to rotate that rod in one direction or the other. So having a rigid body diagram um, will help you say, okay, where are the forces acting along that rod, and how do I have to take them into account if I'm going to take in, how do I have to take those forces into account um, in order to uh, look at the torques which are acting on the system, okay? Um, choose your coordinate axes um, and specify the direction, and you should specify a positive direction of rotation for torques. So if you're looking at a torque, um, you can actually say um, that clockwise is positive and counterclockwise is negative. That's okay. Um, now, in general, and for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to be treating counterclockwise as negative, or sorry, I'm going to be treating counterclockwise as positive and clockwise as negative, because that was the convention that we'd previously established when we were dealing with circular motion. However, um, you can um, specify uh, 
um, that the torque is acting in the opposite direction. So you can say that a clockwise rotation is a positive torque and counterclockwise is a negative torque. Much as you can say when you're drawing your coordinate axes, you know, I can, I can draw a coordinate axis that says that this is plus y um, and this is plus x. I mean, I can do that. Um, you don't ordinarily do that, but you can. Uh, so just remember uh, which direction is your positive torque and which direction is your positive x and y. So you also want to choose a reference point about which to compute torques, uh, which is sometimes, uh, sometimes a more complicated decision. And again, we're going to see that um, when, you know, again, if I have a rod, if I have a bar that's moving around, do I say that the axis of rotation is here and do I compute the torques around that point or should I compute the torques around this point over here? Um, you should get the same answer, um, you know, again, assuming that you have a static equilibrium scenario, but there may be easier and harder ways um, to actually understand what's going on. Um, so remember uh, also that forces which act through the axis of rotation create no torque. In order for there to be a torque, there has to be some distance between the force and the axis of rotation. So it may sometimes be convenient, um, as we're going to see in one of these problems, um, to treat um, a particular situation um, where you have a force acting through an axis of rotation so you don't have to account for it when you're accounting for all of the torques. Um, so again, if I have something like a, a, a diving board, haha, <laughs> which I see one of in, in your very near future, um, and I have some weight um, which is acting on this part of the diving board, and this second part is um, held here, you know, um, it may be logical if I want to compute the forces on this point um, to say, all right, um, this is a pivot point and any forces which are acting on it uh, are acting through this pivot point and we can neglect them when we're calculating the torque. Um, and again, this is much easier to show in an example, um, so keep an eye out for that when it shows up. Okay, um, and note that you can choose the axis of rotation wherever you want. Um, so uh, you just have to remember that in a static equilibrium scenario, no matter which axis of rotation you're choosing, the net torques will have to add up to zero. Okay, um, so when you're actually going to execute a problem, uh, you write your equations expressing the equilibrium conditions, which is the sum of forces in X and the sum of forces in Y should also equal zero, should all equal zero, um, and that the sum of the torques should equal zero. And remember that these are all going to be separate equations, um, you know, and all of the conditions have to be satisfied for a static equilibrium to be in place. You can compute the torque of a force by finding the torque from each component separately. So um, let's say that I have some rod here. You know, I got, got some, I got some, some beam, um, you know, and I'm saying, all right, um, what is the, um, you know, torque of this force? Well, I mean, you can use the angle here um, if you want. Or you also can say, I'm going to take this force, this force F, um, and I'm going to split it up into its components. Um, so we've got, ooh, that's not a good color. Um, we've got like, an, you know, we've got Fy, and we've got Fx. And you can compute the, compute the torque um, by only taking a look at Fy, because Fx is acting um, parallel to the beam itself. Um, so uh, again, that's you know, another kind of handy way um, to deal with these problems is that you can uh, compute the torque of a force by finding the torque from each component separately. Um, and again, we'll see some examples where this will be useful. To obtain as many equations as you have unknowns, you may need to compute torques with respect to two or more 
reference points. And by reference point, um, I mean an axis of rotation. Um, so uh, as again, we're going to see, um, if you try, if you want to find uh, the force about two points, um, you know, and you have again, this diver or something which is hanging off of this beam, um, you can actually compute the torque about this point in the middle and this point at the end. Um, and that will let you solve for all of the forces that are acting on this system. Um, there are also are sometimes easier ways to do this where you don't have to compute um, around two different axes of rotation, um, but this is something to keep in mind um, if you're hunting for additional variables to plug into your system of equations. Uh, remember that you can choose different axes of rotation um, about which to compute the torque. Uh, also, if you have time, uh, check your results by writing uh, the sum of torques is equal to zero with respect to a difference, re different reference point, and you should get the same answers. Again, uh, the net torques in a system um, equaling zero is independent of where you are rotating. Um, so if you've got, you know, uh, if something if something's rotating um, in this in this system somewhere about some kind of axis, you no longer have a static equilibrium. Um, so that's kind of a, a good sort of double check. Um, and we'll do sample problems shortly after we learn uh, one new concept, uh, which is the concept of center of gravity. Um, so when we're dealing with a weight, um, you know, again we're dealing with some sort of pencil or, or something which is falling. We can treat a body's weight as though it acts, all acts at a single point, um, and that is the center of gravity. Um, this is very similar to the concept of a center of mass, um, where we have previously talked about translational motion um, and treated certain forces as though they're acting through the center of mass. And when you're dealing with the force of weight, um, and that weight is acting through some central point, um, that's acting through the center of gravity. Now, if we ignore the variation of gravity with altitude, the center of gravity is going to be the same as the center of mass. Um, so weight can be treated as though it is acting entirely through the center of mass and through the center of gravity. Um, there may be some, you know, strange exceptions. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd imagine, um, I'm not entirely sure, so maybe don't quote me on this. Um, you know, maybe somebody at NASA can actually chime in here. If you're looking at, say, orbital dynamics, um, you know, or you're looking at um, how satellites orbit uh, or something like that, um, you may have to treat center of gravity and center of mass as different. But for the purposes of this course, center of gravity and center of mass um, are one in the same. Okay, um, so. To be in equilibrium, a body supported at several points must have its center of gravity somewhere within the area bounded by the supports. So if you have a car on a curve um, or something like that, and you've got, you've got this thing on a, on a slope, the weight acting through the center of gravity has to be between these areas of support um, so that the support um, can uh, do kind of a countervailing torque, if you will. So um, this weight here, um, we can imagine, is tending to rotate the car in this direction. Um, and to counter that, or sorry, actually, it's tending to rotate the car in the, um, yeah, it would, be, it would be tending to rotate it in this direction, um, meaning um, that you have to have um, some countervailing force um, such as from these wheels here, um, which would be tending to rotate it in the opposite direction. Um, <clears throat> all right. However, if the weight is outside of um, this um, area of support, um, so if the thing is banked too steep uh, and you have the center of gravity outside of the area of support, then the car is going to roll. Um, you know, you can't actually have um, enough countervail countervailing torque to prevent that from rolling. Um, and in general, um, or not in general, in, in life, uh, the higher the center of gravity, the smaller the incline needed to tip the vehicle over. So we have here a high center of gravity, um, and we have this area of support, um, and the center of gravity um, is outside of that area of support, so this truck is going to roll. Um, 
Okay, um, so generally you want a low center of gravity and you need to make sure that the center of gravity is within the area of support um, in order to prevent uh, something from rolling uh, and therefore to have that thing be in equilibrium. Right, so we're gonna do three sample problems for static equilibrium, um, get comfortable. Um, so this is going to be uh, a, bit of a bit of a trek, but I think you're gonna find that the results are actually really kind of cool. Uh, so, uh, in this first one, uh, we have a uniform beam uh, of weight uh, W sub M and length L hinged to a wall at one end, um, so it's hinged to a wall here, um, and supported by a cable at the other end. So we have this cable, and it's basically keeping this thing uh, supported. The cable makes an angle theta with the beam as shown, and a sign of weight, a sign of weight, uh, oh yes, a sign of weight uh, W sub S is suspended from the end of the beam. So we have here a sign, um, and you basically have a sign which is hanging off of uh, some sort of a supported beam here. We're asked to find the tension of the cable and the force exerted on the wall end of the beam, so the forces that are acting here, um, if uh, the weight of the beam itself um, is 38 newtons, if the weight of the sign is 60 newtons, if theta is equal to 30 degrees, and if this length L is equal to 10 meters. Um, okay, uh, so let's go ahead and just kind of do a quick rundown of what we know. Um, so first thing we want to do is draw a free body diagram with a coordinate system uh, and draw force vectors at the point and angle where they are applied. So we're just going to consider what's going on with this beam here. Uh, we're also going to take a quick note uh, that the height um, of this uh, particular wall is 5.77 meters um, because this is 30 degrees. Um, so you can find this by using the tangent inverse. Um, you know, so this is opposite over adjacent. So uh, tan inverse of 30 degrees um, will equal opposite over adjacent. This is x, and you can solve for x. Um, all right. Then uh, let's draw in all of the force vectors um, which are um, active here or which, or which are making a difference on this particular beam. And we actually have three potential axes of rotation. The first axis of rotation um, is basically, this is the hinge here, um, and the force from the wall um, is potentially rotating um, what's going on, uh, or potentially rotating it at this pivot point. The second axis of rotation, axis of rotation number two, is we have the weight, which is tending to pull the rod downward, um, and we have the tension, which is going to be tending to pull this thing upwards. And there's actually a third axis of rotation, and this one's a little bit more difficult to visualize, but we have some point here um, outside of the beam, and because there is a push um, from, our, from the wall, push from the wall, and a pull of tension, there's actually a tendency to rotate like that, right? So I've got tension, tension's going to be pulling kind of this way, R is going to be kind of pulling this way, and the result would be something like this. Um, and again, what are, what's this R, X, and R, Y business? Um, that's the force from the wall onto, onto um, this particular beam. So when you have a beam which is going ka-chunk um, here, um, and it's being held in place um, by a tension, um, and it's being pulled on um, by this weight, um, as you can imagine, this is compressing the beam into the wall. And because uh, forces happen in pairs, as you compress into the wall, the wall compresses back at you, and it compresses back at the beam. Um, and that's actually going to have two components. Um, there's going to be an X component, which is holding this outward, um, and then there is a Y component, which is going to be counteracting the weight, um, you know, um, as, as, we're going, as we're going to see. So that's where this Ry, Rx comes from. Uh, we've explained the three axes of rotation. Uh, we've got tension, tension's acting at a 30 degree angle. Um, and we have two different weights um, which are happening here. Now the first weight 
um, is obvious. That's the weight of the sine. That's 90 newtons. Um, and this 90 newtons um, is acting at the very edge or the very tip um, of this beam. So we've got something and it's hanging, you know, on this, um, on this beam. Okay. Um, and uh, then we also have the weight of the beam itself. Um, so uh, what's, that, what's that going to do? Well, because the center of gravity and the center of mass in this case are the same, the weight of the beam um, is acting through the center of mass. And if one of the ends is fixed, that's actually going to, going to tend to be a rotating um, force or a rotating weight. Um, you know, and well, let's, let's see. Yeah, as you can see, the weight of the pencil um, has caused it to rotate. Um, and maybe I can stop cheating with my fingers, but we have to account for the weight of the bar itself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So uh, let's apply both conditions of equilibrium uh, in component form uh, and see what happens. See if we can solve for tension uh, and for Ry and Rx. Um, and once we've solved for e these individual components, we will then have a vector um, of the force of the wall that's acting on this beam. All right. So let's first take a look at axis of rotation two and the torque equals zero condition in order to solve tension. Um, why would we be wanting to do that? Well, um, of these three different axes of rotation, um, the tension is acting through axis of rotation number one. So the contribution of tension to torque about this point, about axis of rotation number one, is going to be zero. We could uh, go through axis of rotation number three, but um, that, that looks kind of complicated, doesn't it? The simplest thing um, is to just go through axis of rotation two. So we've got a tension. The tension is going like that. Um, you know, to our particular to our particular beam. This is our pivot point, and it looks like it should be fairly straightforward to determine the torque um, of tension um, on that particular um, beam using that particular reference point, using that particular axis of rotation. Okay, um, then if we're going to take a look at axis of rotation two, um, we also have to consider uh, what other forces may be causing a torque. So what are the forces that are causing a torque with axis of rotation two? It's not Rx and it's not Ry because those are acting through the axis of rotation. Um, so remember how I said you can pick the axis of rotation so it's convenient and it is awfully convenient um, that we can just disregard these forces uh, in this axis of rotation. So we've got a force of tension which is uh, tending to rotate the beam this way we have the weight of the sine, and that weight of the sine is tending to rotate the beam this way. And we've got the weight of the beam itself acting through the center of mass, and that's tending to rotate the beam that way. Okay, um, so let's just uh, continue saying that a counterclockwise rotation is a positive rotation and a positive torque. So I'm gonna define this rotation as positive tau. Um, okay, um, and so the weight of the beam going in this direction is going to be negative. So that's negative WB for weight beam. The torque of the sine is going to be negative. So it's negative uh, torque from the weight of the sine plus the tension um, times the length of the lever arm times sine of 30 degrees. So this would be torque of tension. Um, and I just made the substitution here. So it's tension um, times the length of the lever arm and this lever arm from here to here is 10 meters, 10 meters, okay? Um, and then sine of 30 degrees, and this is the formula for torque. Okay, so how about the torques um, of uh, the weight of the beam and the weight of the sine? Well, uh, let's just erase this, make this a little more clear. And let's erase that. What we've got is this 38 Newtons 
again, is acting through the center of mass. This distance is going to be five meters. This is a regular shape. Uh, and because it is a regular shape of uniform composition, the center of mass is going to be in the geometric center, um, which in this case means it's going to be five meters uh, from either end of the stick, and we're looking at uh, rotation about the end of that stick. Uh, so, okay, it's negative 38, or it's 38 newtons acting five meters away uh, from the axis of rotation. So negative 38 newtons times five meters. Cool. Um, then this second weight of sine, this WS, that's 90 newtons. It's acting in the negative direction, so it's a negative torque. Um, the length of the lever arm here is 10 meters. It's the same length as the uh, tension lever arm. Um, and then you say it's plus 10, uh, T times 10 meters times sine of 30 degrees, which is what we'd seen in the previous equation. Okay. So if we go ahead and evaluate this uh, and we solve for T, we find that T is equal to 218 newtons. Um, and that is the first part of this problem. So how exactly are we going to solve Ry? Um, well, um, there's only really one logical place you can look. So uh, Ry um, is acting parallel to the axis of rotation 3. Um, so that's not going to have a torque. Um, it's, as we saw and as we took advantage of, axis of rotation 2. It's acting through axis of rotation 2, so it's not going to have a torque there. But it will have a torque about axis of rotation number 1, right? I mean, you got an arrow here, and you got this lever arm, and you got this axis of rotation. All right, so we can look at that um, in order to solve um, R sub y. Okay. So negative r sub y, uh, and again, what we're saying is this direction is a positive torque, okay? So because r y is tending to rotate in that direction, that is therefore a negative torque. So it's negative r y times 10 meters. Again, that's length of the lever arm um, plus this weight here, the weight of the beam, and the length of its lever arm, which is five meters. Okay? Um, and in this case, because we're going through uh, axis of rotation uh, number one, uh, the tension and the weight of the sign don't come into our calculation at all. So this is the expression uh, for the torques about axis of rotation one. And we go ahead and solve for Ry, and we find that Ry is equal to 19 newtons. Okay, so uh, we're in um, good shape here. We've got um, the force of tension, and we've got Ry, so the Y component of uh, what the wall is doing to the beam. What about the X component? Well, we're in luck. There are two ways that you can solve uh, for Rx, and it depends on which equilibrium condition you're using. So we've been having fun with the, you know, torque equilibrium um, condition. Um, so let's take a look at rotation um, about this third axis of rotation, right? Um, so what's going on here? Um, <clears throat> Rx um, is tending to push this beam in this direction, and once again, we're going to call this a positive torque, right? So if the beam's being pushed in this direction by Rx, uh, then Rx is positive. That's a positive torque. Uh, what's acting against that? Well, there's uh, W sub B. There's the weight of the beam. That's tending to rotate um, it generally in, in this direction. Um, <clears throat> You know, so basically, you know, in a big old sweep, it's looking like that. Therefore, that's a negative torque or a torque of the opposite sign um, of Rx. Um, okay, then how about um, our kind of third uh, protagonist, our third wheel, as it were? That's going to be the weight of the sign, and the weight of the sign is tending to rotate in that direction. Okay, um, so that's also negative, much as the weight of the beam is negative. We have our expression here, um, 
And uh, why am I saying uh, 5.77 meters? Well, we'd solved over here that this height is 5.77 meters and the rotation axis uh, AOR3, AOR3 um, is actually anchored at this point here where the wire meets the wall. Okay, so that's why, where we get this 5.77 business from. Um, we know five meters because that's five meters, and we know it's 10 meters uh, for the other one because that's 10 meters. This is where the five and the 10 come from. All right, so we go ahead and solve for Rx, and we find that it's 188.8 uh, .8 newtons. But sometimes that can be kind of hard to visualize. You're, you're, you're trying to visualize what this is doing kind of like that and that's you don't ordinarily think of that as a rotation um, i mean you can solve the problem we just did um, but it may be a little bit easier to use the sum of forces condition um, in this particular case when you're dealing with a static equilibrium so what do i mean by sum of forces well the sum of forces in the x direction um, is going to be equal to zero. Uh, so let's get rid of all this other jazz here. Um, so we know that this beam um, is not accelerating upwards. Woohoo! It's not, it's not doing one of those numbers. We also know that it's not going like this. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not doing a, a dance routine um, or, or anything like that. Um, so um, in the x direction, we have Rx, and Rx is acting in this direction. It's the force from the wall that's tending to push the pencil in the positive x direction. What's counteracting that? Well, it's going to be the tension, right? So the tension is pushing the pencil back in. Um, and more accurately, more precisely, it's going to be the x component of the tension. Um, so what is the x component of the tension? Well, we can draw our right triangle here, and we're trying to find Tx, and because this is 30 degrees, that's going to be equal to T cosine 30 degrees. And we already know what T is. So <clears throat> if we go ahead and make our substitutions, we find, whew, I love it when that happens, that R sub x is also equal to 188.8 newtons. And that's a, that's a big relief, isn't it? Um, so if we're going to put this in uh, vector form, um, you can say uh, that our x uh, and our y, you know, we've got our components here. Um, it's going to be 188.8 newtons i cap plus 19 newtons j cap. Or if you want to put this in polar form, um, the polar form is going to be 190 newtons 5.75 degrees, um, and that's left as an exercise to the viewer. Okay, uh, so that's pretty good. Um, let's take a look at another example. Um, let's take a look at a diving board. Uh, we will spring right into the next problem here. Uh, we will dive right into it. Uh, we will stop making bad jokes. Well, maybe for this problem, we'll stop making bad jokes. Um, so the figure below shows a diver of weight uh, 580 newtons, uh, standing at the end of a diving board with a length of 4.5 meters and negligible mass. The board is fixed to two pedestals uh, that are se separated by a distance of 1.5 meters. Uh, so um, this distance here, D, is 1.5. Um, this distance here, L, is 4.5. Um, and one very important piece of information um, is that the length or the weight of the board itself has negligible mass, um, which means that we don't have to worry about the contribution um, of the board itself to any net torques um, on this particular system. Um, so we're basically saying, okay, um, relative to the weight of the person, uh, we don't have to worry about the weight of the board. Okay, and therefore we don't have to worry about the weight vector of the board. So we're asked of the forces acting on the board, what are the magnitude and direction up or down of the force from the left pedestal uh, and in the right pedestal, 
um, and which pedestal is being stretched and which pedestal is being compressed. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we have pedestal one and we have pedestal two, um, and these are all and these are both potentially rotation axes, um, and so I've marked them as you know red circles here. Uh, we have a weight uh, which is acting on this board, um, and uh, as you're noticing, uh, likely generating a torque. Uh, you know we're rotating the board. Um, okay, so to solve the point on force on point one, let's use point two as an axis of rotation. Uh, let's just say the rotation's happening here, and therefore we can neglect um, any forces that are acting on point two um, just for the moment, because that's our axis of rotation. Um, so we've got some force here. Um, it's kind of as a teeter-totter. We're saying that's point two, where my fingers are, um, and there's a push from the weight and that's tending to rotate this way, okay? Um, but because we're told um, that this is at a static equilibrium, and I'm pushing down this way, there must be some countervailing force that's pushing here to counteract the weight here, okay? Um, so some of the torques around point P2 is equal to zero, and in vector format, um, just to show what I was showing with the pencil, um, we have force one uh, pressing down on point one. Okay. So now all we got to do um, is evaluate. Um, so there's force F1, and it's acting with a lever arm um, of 1.5 meters, 1.5 m. Uh, and then the lever arm of the weight is going to be, uh, remember, this entire length um, is 4.5. So uh, the length here, just between the weight and the second pivot, is going to be 3.0 meters, because 3.0 plus 1.5 is equal to 4.5. Okay, so that's what we've got uh, going on here. We know that it's all equal to zero. We are given the weight. Um, now all we've got to do is find force one, and force one is uh, 1,160 newtons. Okay, so that's pretty cool. How do we solve um, for this second point, or the forces that are acting on this second point? Um, two ways to do this. Either you can say, all right, um, we're going to be dealing uh, with P1 as a pivot point, um, you know, and so what's happening here in that case, we have our pivot point, we have a force going down, and counteracting that force somewhere here in the middle, you're going to have a force pulling up, okay? So there's a force pulling up to counteract the force pushing down over here. Um, you can do that. That's, that's, that's what you're doing when you're shifting the pivot point, and then you can disregard force one because it's acting through the pivot point. Uh, or you could remember um, that the sum of forces in the y direction is going to equal zero. So the pressing down of the f on one end of the beam here and the pressing down um, of the weight on this beam here, let's pretend that this doesn't rotate. We've got forces on both ends of the beam. That has to be counteracted by some force in the middle, which is pushing up, okay? Um, because again, this is not translating up or down, um, and it is not rotating one way or the other, all right? So sum of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. And so that force, um, you know, we've got, again, pretend this doesn't rotate for a moment, force one, weight, force two. Force two is pulling up in this case. Um, and that's going to be pulling up uh, at this P2 pivot point. Okay, so zero is equal to uh, negative F1 minus W plus F2, um, and kind of implicit in all of this um, is the fact that I've defined my axes this way, um, so I'm calling this plus Y, uh, and I'm calling this plus X, um, and that explains what the signs are here. Um, we calculated what force one was in the previous slide, uh, which is 1,160 newtons. Uh, we know what the weight is because it's given. 
um, and therefore F2 uh, is going to equal uh, 1740 newtons in the positive direction. How about that kind of third part of the question? Um, what's being stretched and what's being compressed? Well, basically, um, you have at this pivot point a lifting, which is, which is happening. So this is actually a stretch. It's a stretch around pivot point two, and it's a compression. It's kind of a crushing downwards um, on pivot point one. And actually, you can, you can kind of demonstrate this. It's easier to feel it, really, um, than to describe it. Live long and prosper. Anyway, um, if you kind of place your fingers underneath this particular pivot point, if you kind of squeeze downward, you'll note, you know, if you're squeezing downward on both sides, you're going to feel a slight lifting at this second pivot point and feel a slight lifting. Again, assuming that you're squeezing down at both ends, you can think of the board kind of bowing as, as it were. So uh, to sort of comically exaggerate this, um, you're going to end up with something like, well, like this. Okay, so point one is compressed and point two um, is going to be stretched. All right. So uh, finally, uh, let's take a complicated example uh, where we have a crane shown in the diagram made up of a strut and a restraining cable. Uh, the strut is uniform uh, with a length of 6.0 meters and a mass of 85 kilograms. So in this case, the strut does not have a negligible mass and we're going to have to take a look at uh, the behavior um, of the weight through the center of mass. Okay, uh, and I'm going to let Professor Barber uh, draw in the, um, the arrows for us here. Um, so we have on this um, strut, uh, what we've got is we've got um, a force from this pivot, from this pivot onto this point here. We've got a force uh, from this pivot going in the Y direction as well. Uh, we have the weight, which is acting through the center of mass. We have a tension, um, and that tension is actually acting at uh, an angle of 15 degrees, and we have a weight uh, of this particular mass uh, that's going on here, um, and that we're going to say that a, an axis of rotation um, is right here. Um, so how do we know that this is 15 degrees? Well, this is 45 degrees, um, and so this angle here um, is going to be 180 minus 45, okay? Uh, once we solve for this angle, um, we know that this angle is 30 degrees. Um, so if we end up with um, <clears throat> uh, this angle here, plus 30 degrees, plus this, that all has to equal 180 uh, because this is a triangle, right? Um, so that's what gives us this 15 degree um, bit here. Okay, uh, and then we've also defined our axes as plus y and plus x thusly, uh, and we've also defined positive torque as torque that's going in this direction. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, give this a shot. Um, so first thing that we've got to note is that the tension, um, the torque from the tension um, is going to be rotating in a positive direction. So again, here we've got our um, thing. Torque is pulling, or sorry, tension is pulling generally in this direction, which is a positive torque, which is how we defined it. The load is pulling in this direction, and that's applying a negative torque. And then the weight of the strut itself is also tending to move in this direction, which is a negative torque. And we know that all of these things together have to equal zero. So let's go ahead and plug in. Uh, tension um, times six meters. Where do we get the six meters from? The strut is uniform. It has a length of six meters. Um, so T times six meters times sine of 15. That's lever arm times the sine of the angle 
um, times what the force is, uh, minus the um, torque of the load. Um, so that is 150 kilograms uh, times 9.8 meters per second squared because it's a weight um, times six meters. That's the length of the lever arm. Um, and sine of 45 degrees. Where do we get sine of 45 degrees from? Remember, this is a right triangle, we've been told. This is 45 degrees, and therefore this has to be 45 degrees. All right? Um, so we're, you know, in, in good shape here. Um, and then finally, uh, the weight of the strut itself um, is 85 kilograms. That's what we're told the mass of the strut is. Um, times 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, this is happening on Earth, and we're finding a weight um, times three meters. Why three meters? Uh, because once again, the center of mass uh, is in the middle um, of this uh, uniform strut. Um, so center of mass will be in the middle. That means it's going to be three meters there, and then three meters to the end of the rod times sine of 45 degrees. That's the angle of action. Uh, and that whole mess is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so um, we solve for T, uh, and we find that T is equal to 8,004 8, newtons times meters over 6 meters times sine of 15, uh, and the tension uh, is equal to 5,154 newtons. Uh, and now we're asked to find the direction of the force exerted on the strut by the pivot in the arrangement. So I'm gonna get rid of all of this other business. Uh, we're being asked to solve for Rx and Ry. Um, so remember, as this whole thing is moving around, this pivot where my fingers are, that's going to be exerting a force um, on, this, um, on this strut, all right? Um, so we were able to neglect that uh, when we were dealing with the torque uh, because it's, it was acting through the axis of rotation, but those forces are there um, and we need to you know, account for them. Uh, we need to account for them because the problem has asked us to account for them. Um, and so what we've got to note um, is that there's going to be both a Y and X component um, and there's going to be um, some angle theta between them. Uh, so sum of forces in the x direction is equal to zero. Um, so uh, what are uh, the sum of those forces um, in the x direction? Well, now um, we know that Rx, by definition, is going to be acting in this positive direction. That's positive x. Tension um, is going to be acting in a negative direction, but... Um, it's actually going to be acting um, at a, a slightly, slightly funnier angle. Um, so we have this right triangle here, um, and the tension um, <clears throat> is actually going to be acting across this angle, or if we're going to split uh, tension into X and Y components, um, we've got to basically split this here into X and, <clears throat> into X and Y um, components. Um, <clears throat> all right. And this uh, angle here, or actually, sorry, I can tell you exactly where the 30 degrees comes from. Rather than hemming and hawing, that's 30 degrees right there. Uh, and the tension is acting through this cable, and it's acting at a 30 degree angle uh, to the ground. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, yeah, and because it's pointed, because the tension is pointed this way, it's acting in the opposite direction uh, of our X. Um, so again, you've got our X pushing this way, you've got tension pulling that way, um, and the um, direction of X is going to be um, opposite, okay? Uh, so our X minus T cosine 30 degrees is equal to zero. So we know that Rx is equal to 4,464 newtons. Sum in the y direction, um, we know that Ry is pointing up. We know that the weight of the load is pointing down. We know that the weight of the strut, or the weight of the strut itself is pointing down. Um, and we know that this is going to be T sine um, of 30. Um, this is going to be the y component um, of the tension. Um, so again, because these triangles are similar, 
Um, this angle here is 30 degrees, uh, similar to this angle here. So we can go ahead and show that. Got 30 degrees, 30 degrees. This is Tx. This is Ty. The component Ty is equal to T sine 30 degrees. Um, Tx is equal to T cosine 30 degrees. Um, again, Ry acting in the positive direction. Then this is negative, negative, and then the tension is tending to pull down. Um, so that tension is negative equal to zero. We know that Ry is then equal to 4,880 newtons. So uh, if we're looking for what uh, theta is, um, or the angle between Rx and Ry, um, we have to take the tangent inverse uh, of the opposite um, over adjacent, and that's 47.55 degrees. That's the, the upward slant of this um, R, uh, which is the force of the pivot on the strut. Okay, so um, that's, you know, I think a really kind of cool concept uh, and a, you know, introduction to the idea of static equilibrium. So be sure to turn in, tune in next time uh, for chapter 13, uh, where we will be dealing with gravitation. Um, and we've already dealt with the force of gravity and dealt with weights, uh, but now we're going to be dealing with um, explaining exactly how you can have two masses attract each other across thin air, um, or more accurately, <laughs> uh, because we're not getting into uh, relativity, at least I don't think we're getting into relativity, um, how do you calculate the force of gravity uh, between two particular particles with a given mass? Uh, because believe it or not, my left hand and right hand um, are actually attracting each other um, at a very, a very, very small amount um, through gravity. Okay, uh, so thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time.